on March 25, 1911, at 4.45 p.m., just as the workday was about to end, a person walking by the Ash Building in the Greenwich Village neighborhood of New York City looked up and saw smoke pouring out of the 8th floor windows. The home of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, who occupied the 8th, 9th, and 10th floor of the building, employing about 500 people, mostly young Italian and Jewish immigrant women between the ages of 14 and 23. A typical sweatshop for the time. The Triangle Waste Company made women's blouses known as shirtwaist. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire of 1911 was the deadliest industrial disaster in New York City history and one of the deadliest in U.S. history. In total, 146 people died from the fire, most which were very avoidable. The fire led to legislation requiring improved factory safety standards. Fire marshals concluded that the likely cause of the fire was the disposal of a match or cigarette butt into a wooden scrap bin containing flammable fabric cuttings. Even though there were numerous exits, including two stairways, four elevators, and a fire escape, the death toll was still very high. So what caused the death toll to be so high? First, there was no sprinkler system in the factory. Due to all the flammable material in the factory and an oily floor, the fire grew quickly and panic ensued. The young factory workers tried to exit the building via the elevators. The problem was that only two of the four elevators were operational, and the two that were working were right near where the fire started. Two heroic elevator operators, Joseph Zito and Gaspar Martorallo, tried to make as many trips up and down as possible in blinding smoke. Martorallo's elevator broke down quickly from all the heat and flames, while Zito's elevator cable snapped from the weight of all the people in the elevator, plus those that were jumping down the elevator shaft on top of the elevator car while it was still going down. Zito's elevator was not far from the bottom when the cable broke. He broke his leg in the fall, but was able to save many lives in the few trips he was able to make. They saved about 150 people in total, which is about half of all the survivors. In a desperate attempt to escape the fire, the girls left behind waiting for the elevators plunged down the shaft to their deaths. Some terrified employees tried using the fire escape, but the flimsy and poorly built structure collapsed from the heat and overload, sending about 20 people 100 feet down to their deaths. The last form of exit, the two stairways, one leading to Green Street and the other to Washington Place, were the biggest issues. The Green Street staircase would quickly become consumed by flames, making that stairway unusable in both directions. The fire started on the 8th floor. A bookkeeper was able to call and notify people on the 10th floor, so many on the 10th floor were able to survive by using the Green Street staircase going up to the roof, including the two owners, Max Blank and Isaac Harris, also known as the Shirtwaist Kings. The people on the 8th and 9th floors weren't as lucky. The other staircase, the one that went to Washington Place, which was not consumed with flames quickly, was unfortunately locked by management from the outside, which was illegal at the time, to stop people from possibly stealing and to keep union organizers out. It was a series of very unfortunate events. The stairway being locked was the main factor behind the amount of deaths. The boss who had the key to the stairway was not as heroic as the elevator operators and quickly fled, leaving the doors locked and people trapped. Many people either succumbed to the smoke and fire while others jumped to their deaths. The fire department arrived quickly, but their ladders only reached up to the sixth floor, a couple floors shy of being able to rescue people. Like I said, it was a series of very unfortunate and avoidable events. Firefighters also tried catching the people that were jumping down using fire nets, but the victims were jumping from so high up that the nets broke and weren't able to save the people. There was a lot of outrage in the aftermath of the fire. On April 11th, the ILGWU organized a massive funeral procession for the victims. 120,000 people marched, while another 300,000 lined the streets to pay their respects. Six days later, the two owners of the factory were brought up on manslaughter charges, with the prosecution trying to prove that the two owners knew that the exit doors were locked. Ultimately, the two were acquitted since they couldn't fully prove that the two owners had knowledge about the locked doors even though they most likely did know. 
but they were found liable of wrongful death on a civil suit that followed. They were ordered to pay $75 per deceased victim, but they were awarded much more than that, about $400 per victim and their insurance payout. So they ended up turning a profit on the fire. Blanc and Harris had a history of mysterious fires in their factories. It was common practice in the garment industry when you had an overstock of out of style merchandise to burn it and collect the insurance money. But in this case, there was no evidence at all that this fire was started on purpose. All the other fires that happened at previous Blanc and Harris factories happened when there was no employees on site, which probably explains why there was no sprinkler system in the factory in case they ever needed to start a fire on purpose for insurance money. In the years that followed, Blanc and Harris opened up other factories that were caught with safety violations, including locking doors that shouldn't be locked, which is crazy to me. After the fire, a committee on public safety was formed in New York City, along with the American Society of Safety Professionals and the New York State Factory Investigating Commission to investigate factory conditions to prevent hazard or loss of life among employees. A lot of new laws came from the commission findings that improved fireproofing requirements, the availability of fire extinguishers, the installation of fire alarms and sprinklers, among other safety requirements. As horrible as this tragedy was, at least some good came out of it and probably saved future lives. The Ash Building still stands today in New York City, now known as the Brown Building. A memorial for the victims of the fire was unveiled in 2023. The memorial consists of a steel ribbon descending from the building before splitting into two horizontal ribbons on the corner of the building. The ribbon lists the names and ages of all the victims. Thanks for watching. As always, I appreciate it. Please subscribe for more historical videos. Take care.